Thank you everyone for joining us in today's discussion. My name is Bianca Winata Putri. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at ECA. I am Zooming in today from my living room slash home office. I am a Chinese Indonesian woman in her mid twenties. I have glasses on and I'm wearing a blue sweater. I'm sitting close to my computer so you can only see my head and shoulders with white walls behind me and a red colored framed artwork. There's also a relatively huge Monstera plant in the background as well. I'd like to start by acknowledging that today I'm speaking to you as a visitor on the lands of the Kulin nations, and I'd like to extend my respect to elders past, present, and emerging of these lands and of the lands on which you are all joining us today from. Today's artist talks is part of the exhibition, A Biography of Daphne, curated by Mihna Mirkan and currently on display at ACA until the 5th of September. A few housekeeping items before we start the discussion, please submit your questions via the Q&A tab and we will try to answer them at the end of the session if time permits. We are also joined today by our live Auslan interpreters, Tyson and Imran. This session is also being recorded for podcast and video release, which will be accessible via ACA's website and through your favorite podcast provider. Closed captions is also available live for this webinar, as well as for the video recording. It is now my great pleasure to welcome curator Mihna Mirkan and artists Hu Chin Yen, Jill Majid, Candice Lin, and P staff. Mihna, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Bianca, for the kind introduction and for the uh, acknowledgement of country. I also wish to acknowledge the Kulin Nation as the sovereign custodians of the land I work on. Um, the warmest thanks to Jill, uh, to Candice and P for their participation in this event and for their contribution to the exhibition. My gratitude also goes to the other artists whose work uh, the show includes and to Aka, of course, for the um, extraordinarily generous support of my project. A biography of Daphne takes its point of, of departure, the classical myth of Daphne, the nymph who turned into a tree to escape the assault of, of the god Apollo. This is a narrative of trauma, crisis, and metamorphosis that the show seeks to update as an allegory of contemporary urgencies and predicaments. The biography of Daphne is the biography of a point of inflection in the constitution of a figure, of a rupture and the recomposition, which brings together dissonant orders of representation in a fraught accord. Asking myself what precisely changes in the metamorphosis, three axes became apparent as perspective lines underpinning the exhibition. Rather than converge with a kind of geometric precision around the vanishing point, these axes coil and twine in a fractured syntax, in its turn, a modality to capture a body that is violated and reconfigured. So Daphne's metamorphosis might be simplified as the interplay of three distinct and interrelated processes, becoming three, becoming image and becoming contemporary. The last of these, becoming contemporary, is an uninterrupted series of updates of the myth from the Middle Ages when the nymph Daphne is transformed not just into a tree, but also into a model of Christian chastity to surrealism and beyond, when the artists reimagine Daphne as an embodiment of the tensions between the dark forces of the psyche and the ravages of war. Between these chronological extremities, there is a whole range, a whole semantic range that Daphne's violent encounter with Apollo and with her tree is measured against. A myth that is always in the process of being reimagined, made contemporaneous and resignified. The exhibition inscribes itself in this lineage, delineating a contemporary backdrop for the transformation, Daphne's and our own. The second axis, becoming uh, the second axis, sorry, becoming image, is the inventory of solutions to for the question of of the metamorphosis, mitigations of its resistance to representation, but also a radical reorientation of the figure itself. This is a figure becoming a ground via the mimicry of its surroundings, a vertiginous scene where Daphne's flight is interrupted by the roots that stem from her from her feet, and she is transformed into a photosynthetic being thus able to withstand the onslaught of the sun god, as well as into a photographic copy of her milieu, the forest she becomes a part of. The metamorphosis is a switch from portrait to landscape in, in, in terms of the axis of orientation of uh, representation, from the impaired visual fields of a figure in flight 
to a landscape without figures. Finally, becoming, uh, becoming three uh, is possibly the most productive connection to the projects that um, our interlocutors today will, will introduce as this telescope between temporalities and chronologies of transformation. Becoming Tree is a process that in the exhibition is in a sense never achieved um, throughout the show. There are prefigurations of, of the vegetal and of the arboreal, ar of arborescence, but never a fully formed tree. And in that context, I would like to um, attempt to share my screen and introduce two images. Um, the image that I hope you're able to see um, is the first uh, image that visitors see in the exhibition, and this is the very last. Um, so this is Anthony Waterloo um, on loan from the National Gallery of Victoria, uh, Daphne being chased by Apollo, a highly unusual representation of the myth, which does not depict the metamorphosis itself, but rather the, the flight that um, that precedes it and the crisis that precipitates the, the metamorphosis. Um, the very last picture, um, of course, the, the, the outcome of the chase is possibly quite, quite clearly prefigured in the fact that Daphne seems to be running from and into the forest. Um, the very last image that visitor sees uh, is a depiction of the moment when Apollo has apprehended Daphne, but she escapes him uh, by, um, slide drifting into another uh, ontological regime uh, by becoming a tree. Um, the exhibition is quite clearly bracketed between these two images as as uh, as, pres as visual presences, but also as, as chronological marks in a sense. Um, and their position um, in the exhibition suggests that the temporal landscapes that are animated by the, the works that the show includes are somehow compressed in the spasmodic interval that exists in the myth between these two moments. These two moments, the two moments that are represented in these two images are only separated by a few seconds, a few, an interval of a few seconds that the show stretches so as to accommodate the various uh, timelines um, that, um, that, that the work that the show includes. Uh, and among those timelines, I'm i um, very happy that we will address the um, notions of metamorphosis um, of the world and of the self that are present in uh, the works of Jill Magid, um, Hotunian, Candice Lynn, and P. Stapp. Um, I will, um, I would like to introduce, to stop my screen share. I would like now. Uh, I would. I would now like to introduce um, Jill Magid, um, who is a Brooklyn-based artist, writer, and filmmaker, uh, and whose work investigates societal power structures and questions of access and visibility. Jill's recent solo exhibitions include the Renaissance Society in Chicago, uh, Dia Bridgehampton, San Francisco Art Institute, Tate Modern, and Tate Liverpool, Berkeley Museum of Art, California, and the Security and Intelligence Agency of the Netherlands in The Hague. Her first feature length film, The Proposal, um, made in 2018, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and received numerous festival awards. Uh, her work is included in the collections of the Centro Pompidou, Whitney Museum of American Art, the Humex Foundation in Mexico City, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, among others. Um, Jill is the recipient of the 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship, a 2020 Creative Time Artist Commission, and the 2017 Calder Prize. Over to you, Jill. Oh, I think by now I wouldn't do that. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Minha. Thanks for introducing me and bringing me here with um, with Candice and two. Um, I'm excited to present. I know we only have 10 minutes, so I'll try to um, just share my screen and jump in. Um, here we go. Um, hold on, now it's not showing up. Um, let me see. Can you see this slide? 
Okay, it's not on the right slide, but um, at least you can. Um, hold on, it's not what I meant to show. Why did this work when you, we tested it? <laughs> no, it's not. There we go. Okay. Okay. So um, this piece is called Auto Portrait Pending, and it's included in um, the Daphne show. Um, it's a piece from 2005, and um, I will just flip through the installation of it and then get into what the work is. Um, so um, in 2005, I made this piece when I learned it was possible to make, create diamonds out of the carbon found in human remains. Um, so this piece is essentially um, a, about becoming, a kind of becoming. I was really interested in the conflation between the artist's body and the artist's work um, and the commercialness of that, of how um, oftentimes when we're talking about artist works, people will say like, I own a de Kooning or I own, you know, someone's, it, there's a collapse between the, the work and the creator of the work. Um, so what you're looking at here is an empty solitaire ring setting um, and it is essentially my grave. So when I die, I will be um, made into a one carat diamond and the diamond um, that's created from the remains of my body will be inserted and set into this ring setting. Um, and the way it's installed, this is not the way it's in, um, this is not a picture from the show at ACA, but it's similar to this. Um, the ring setting, the empty ring setting is in a wall vitrine um, lit with one light. And then in this um, vitrine is a series of documents. And um, in my work, I'm, I'm really interested in the law and the manipulation of the law and kind of the poetic potential of the law. And this was my first piece I did in which I worked with a lawyer and um, invoked the law in the piece. Um, so what you see here are three sets of documents. The first one that's closest to us with two pages is um, the company called Life Gem that does this process of converting um, ashes, cremated remains into diamond. Um, the middle document, um, when I talked to Life Gem, um, they said that people often send a will and testament with the request to be um, for, for the remains to be turned into a diamond. And then the last document is called the beneficiary agreement, which I'll get to. Um, and so I often in my own work use my body or myself as a protagonist of the work to kind of try to understand a system, in this case, a, a corporate system of, um, I guess you could say of control usually. This one I would say what really interested me was the extreme collapse of the metaphor that um, we think of diamonds, at least in the United States and most of the West um, as meaning love or immortality um, and status and wealth. And then when I learned that the conversion of carbon from a body becomes a diamond and then like the tagline of life gem is um, a diamond is forever, which of course means a lot of different things now that it's a body. And one thing I would say that's just interesting about the process of a human body becoming um, a diamond is a scientist was explaining to me that the carbon that becomes the diamond, it's it's not like it's changing. The carbon in your body that is the diamond is the same exact carbon. It's just reformed under heat and pressure. So I think there's something really interesting in the relationship of the show with Daphne, how she, her body becomes a tree um, and there's no loss of that transformation really. It, you know, it's like a, a true, at least in the myth, obviously, it's a true transformation into a tree. And so um, I found that kind of interesting. So 
um, this piece is a kind of in a pregnant pause while I'm still alive. Um, it is only enacted after my death that the diamond um, is made. And um, the beneficiary contract is a legal document um, that basically says that once I, once I die, if a collector has bought the piece, um, that the collector is responsible to receive the diamond and set it into the ring setting and has no other responsibilities around the death. So the my body as artwork and my body as deceased body and all of the relation emotional relationships of my life are separated out in that contract. Um, very quickly, I'll go um, uh into a related piece that formally looks very similar, but is um, actually quite different. Um, and considering we don't have much time, I'll, I'll sort of run through the slides quickly and just get to um, the, the piece called The Proposal, which also uses a diamond made from human remains. So later on, I made a piece, um, Minha mentioned the film, The Proposal, um, is about this piece, but um, to shorten it, Luis Betagon was a Mexican architect um, who died um, and his archive was purchased by a Swiss furniture company that um, strongly enforces the intellectual property rights and the copyrights over Barragon's work. And they also trademarked his name without the accent. So you see this neon piece that toggles between these two bodies, Betagon, the Mexican architect, and Berrigan, the restricted copyrighted name and all of the, um, the financial gain that comes from owning um, the rights to his name and work. And so I made, I, I was really interested, um, again, like auto portrait pendings about my own legacy, but really um, the commercialization of the artist's body and work um, um, sort of being a similar thing. Like the diamond that I made there is meant to be purchased so that there's that true becoming from a human being into a commodity. Whereas Barragon, when his work was purchased and the rights to his work by this Swiss company, um, there was, a, it, first of all, it wasn't his choice. And then also those, um, those transformations between his body and his body of work became um, a different commercial endeavor. So I made a series of works um, using my own body in a different way than I did in auto portrait pending. Here I entered a story between this um, problematics of a legacy being created in one country and the rights to it being owned in another country and inserted myself into this story. This is me in Barragon's house that's a museum and um, formed a relationship with the um, owner of the Swiss corporation that bought the rights to Barragon's work. And when I say the rights to Barragon's work, it's also an interesting transformation. The Swiss company that bought the rights to Barragon's work do not own any of his buildings. They only own the rights to all of his images. So every time someone photographs his work, they own the rights. So therefore they own the legacy and how it's um, propagated. So um, these are just some of the works in which I was challenging what it means to own image rights and how representation of an artist's work is affected when the artist or the um, a state of the artist um, is limited in its ability to represent that artist's work without permission from its owners. Um, so here, for example, is a framed um, book cover um, because I'm not allowed to reproduce images of Barragon's work, but if they're previously published, I framed um, the image on this book as if I could have access to it, but it's really on a pre-published book about Barragon's work. So all the sculptures and works that I made were um, ways to 
accept the law um, of the rights that the copyright owners had, but find ways to find um, find ways to represent Baragon's work using the law to create um, sculptural ways around infringement. It's hard to do this in 10 minutes. Um, so <laughs> um, to skip ahead, I um, after I was making artworks that I was challenging um, the, the rights to Baragon's work sculpturally by representing his work in ways that almost infringed on copyright, but just, just about cut it short. I had the idea um, that uh, maybe there was a way to challenge the ownership of Baragon, of the Swiss corporation's rights to Baragon's work. And the story is that um, the Swiss corporation, the, the man who owns it, um, was married to, is married to a woman who's now in charge of Baragon's estate once they bought it, but he bought it as a wedding present um, for the wife of the owner of the Swiss company. And so when he proposed marriage, she said, um, I, I will marry you, but rather than a wedding ring, I want Baragon's archive. And he bought it for her. And then she established this foundation that, that invokes strongly the copyrights. So I wondered if I could reverse the myth um, or the story of how um, Federica is the name of the woman acquired the archive, the body of work and therefore um, Baragon's name and the rights to his work. And I um, proposed to use his ashes, which are was buried in um, the National Monu Monument in Mexico of Guadalajara um, because he was a national hero and got access through Congress and his family to take a portion of his ashes um, and create from them, um, I'll skip to it, um, to create from them a diamond that was the diamond that the story is that rather than a ring, the owner of the company's wife wanted Baragon's archive instead. So in this case, the body was Baragon and this piece is not for sale. So it's the exact opposite of where I'm gonna be a ring. Um, instead, this collapse of the body with the body of work was offered as a proposal, as a way to reverse the original proposal. So I offered to Federica that if she takes the body, if she accepts the body, the proposal was the ring, um, that in turn, she would return the body of work and make it accessible to the public. Um, and so, um, Maybe I'll leave it at that. I feel like I was probably more confusing than helpfulness to try to do this in 10 minutes. Um, but I think the takeaway is the, um, this transformation from, from the body into diamond, this form that's exactly the same actually, but using that transformation in the first case to question um, my body in relationship to my work in terms of commodity in the art market and then this piece with copyright and intellectual property rights and representation that the rings um, is a kind of provocation to challenge the way um, the rights to someone's work can be purchased and controlled. Thank you so much, Jill, for this um, fascinating introduction to the space between these very different diamonds um, and the very different um, ideas of metamorphosis that they embody or will embody. Um, it's time to introduce our second panelist. Um, Ho Tsun Yan is a Singaporean artist who's work includes uh, film, video, performance, and immersive multimedia installations uh, and uh, unravel unspoken layers of Southeast Asian histories while also pointing to the ambiguities that these produce in the present. A case in point is the multimedia project, The Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia, Volume 1, G, G for Ghost Writers, developed during a residency at Asia Art Archive, a project that I believe we will hear about um, 
in a second. Two has had um, solo exhibitions at the Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media, Edith Roos House for Media Art in Oldenburg, Kunzwara in Hamburg, Mink Contemporary Art Museum in Shanghai, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, and Art Space Sydney. He also represented Singapore at the 54th Venice Biennial in, um, in 2011. Over to you two. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Good morning. And um, yeah, so it's morning in Singapore from where I am. So because of uh, the time, I will jump uh, straight into the presentation. So let me share my screen. Yeah. So is, uh, can everyone see the image? Yeah, great. Thanks. So, yeah, so the title of the work uh, that's being uh, exhibited at Daphne uh, at Akka is called Two or Three Tigers. So this is a work that was done in 2015. And I'll start the presentation just by uh, speaking a little bit about it. It's a two channel video installation with two screens um, facing each other. So on one screen, we have a tiger and on the other screen, we have a man. Uh, and uh, what we are looking at now is uh, an image of the tiger, which is uh, entirely constructed in CGI. Uh, so it's uh, computer graphics and uh, it's animated uh, and the motions and the facial expressions of the tiger comes actually from uh, an actor who is also the singer and the vocalist of the piece. Uh, he's a British uh, singer called Vindicatrix. So we captured him. Uh, he was suspended from uh, the ceiling while he was performing the song. And we captured all of his motions and movements and inserted it into this uh, CGI uh, puppet or shell. So this is an image of the other screen, the facing screen. Um, so hold on, let me see if I can. So uh, this is an image of the opposite screen where we see uh, the other figure of the work. Uh, he's a Caucasian male uh, dressed in white. And uh, so together with the tiger, uh, this man is uh, singing a duet. And uh, this duet, if I'm to summarize it, it's a duet about the history of tigers in uh, Southeast Asia, specifically uh, in Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a history that goes back uh, more than a million years uh, because tigers uh, dispersed through Southeast Asia more than a million years ago when Southeast Asia was still one continuous land piece called the Sunda Shelf. So uh, after that, sea levels rose and broke Southeast Asia apart into its current state. So in a way, the history of tigers is much older than the history of uh, the Homo sapiens. So uh, it's also interesting that in the Malay world, uh, where these stories and myths of tigers are uh, prevalent, tigers are often uh, regarded as ancestors. And it, in some way, it's true because the, the tigers were here before Homo sapiens. So this is a shot, uh, an installation shot. Uh, not of uh, the exhibition at Akka. So this comes from before. So we basically can see the two screens with the tiger and um, the man in the, in the midst of a duet. So uh, these are more images of the screen with the tiger. And um, the only other element present is actually a sun and a moon, which uh, revolves around the two screens. And the sun and the moon is also the light source. So they cast shadows of the tiger or the man uh, onto the tiger and the man respectively. You know. So um, 
they each kind of like influence uh, the other. And at some point, um, the tiger starts to uh, metamorphosize, starts to transform. And I think, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about transformation, uh, metamorphosis in relation to animation, uh, because I believe, you know, one of the fundamental properties of animation is the propensity for metamorphosis. So we, we see this in the earliest uh, animation works created. Uh, animation has always been uh, dedicated to transformation uh, because of its freedom from the laws of uh, physics. Yeah. And uh, it, it is, you know, the other property of uh, animation that really interested me in this work is uh, the absence of gravity. So in, in animation, there is no need to obey uh, gravity. You know, I think gravity uh, pervades you know, let's say a live action uh, filming, you know, whenever you use the camera, there is some kind of gravity. Uh, but with animation, one is free from that, you know, so one is also free to transform. So there are moments in which uh, the tiger undergoes uh, these continuous uh, states of uh, metamorphosis. Um, and at a certain moment, uh, the tiger and the man also kind of like transform uh, into each other. So, uh, you know, going back to this configuration of the man and the tiger singing, uh, I wanted to kind of like trace it back uh, to its source for like, you know, why did I come up with this uh, uh, configuration of a man, of a white Caucasian man and a tiger kind of like, facing each other and singing this uh, duet. So uh, the source for this actually comes out of a print that was uh, produced in 1865 by a German artist called, uh, his name is Heinrich Leutemann. Uh, the name of this print is Interrupted Road Survey in Singapore. And uh, this is actually a record of an actual event that happened in Singapore in uh, uh, 1835. So we see a, a white male uh, uh, in, in the image. Uh, he's surrounded by an entourage of uh, uh, workers slash prisoners. So upon research, we found out that uh, the entourage of this white man was uh, were in fact uh, consisted of uh, Indian prisoners uh, who were uh, in forced labor. So this was at the moment when the British had um, abolished uh, slavery and they used instead uh, convict workers from India to replace uh, the workforce that was lost uh, by the abolition of slavery. And uh, this was actually a road survey mission carried out uh, by the uh, white man uh, in question. His name is uh, George Dromgold Coleman. He was Singapore's first, uh, I would say, first official urban planner, uh, chief architect, and also road surveyor. So one of the first things the British did in their colonies was always the road survey. So when you, when you do a survey, you are actually, in some sense, converting a landscape into numbers, you know, as a way to map the landscape precisely. So in this image, uh, we see the moment when this road survey mission encountered a tiger, a Malayan tiger, which leapt out at them. Uh, and interestingly, this tiger didn't end up killing anyone in the entourage. Rather, the tiger went straight for the machine or the instrument, which is known as the theodolite. So in this image, uh, you can see the theodolite uh, in the midst of falling, uh, suspended in midair. And the theodolite is uh, the most expensive piece of equipment used in survey missions. So it's uh, used for triangulations. Uh, and so the tiger kind of knew what it was doing, you know, like forget the humans and, uh, you know, go straight for the machine. Uh, but also in this uh, picture, you know, which uh, it evokes many kind of thoughts. If we, if we think about the survey mission as the mission of, um, 
a modernizing of, uh, of control, of converting you know, landscapes into numbers. We, we see this interruption of the survey as that suspension of uh, the work of uh, modernity and calculation and surveillance. Um, and to have everything kind of like suspended in mid-air is, is also to be in that moment in which there is uh, uh, a moment of uncertainty as to how things might fall after that. But the other uncertainty I would like to think about is to actually think about what this tiger is. So I mentioned earlier that there are myths uh, related to tigers uh, all over Southeast Asia. And uh, in many parts of Southeast Asia, there's the indigenous belief that tigers are a kind of ancestral uh, manifestation or that tigers are vehicles or mediums uh, that can transport uh, ancestral spirits. So there is also the myth that tigers and humans can transform into each other. So we have were tigers, just like I guess Europe has its werewolves. And I think like South America has its like jaguars, right? So um, this is actually a later work that I did uh, called One or Several Tigers. It's almost the sequel to Two or Three Tigers in which I reconstructed the entire scene uh, in computer graphics, but I won't speak too much about it. I just wanted to show this image uh, very quickly from 1906. This is a photograph of two Malay were tigers, Malayan were tigers by an English anthropologist called uh, Walter William Skitt. I have no idea how he identified these guys as were tigers. It, this photo with the caption simply appears. Um, so with that, I want to like speak about uh, another work in which uh, Tiger uh, plays a very important part. And this work uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, it's called the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia. So uh, my interest in the tigers sort of comes out of this uh, larger project that started some time ago. Uh, the image that I'm showing here is actually a screenshot from a website. And on this website, we have a film which is uh, algorithmically edited. It's edited by a set of algorithms uh, using only footage that are uh, channeled or borrowed or stolen from uh, various online sources. And it reconfigures all these images according to 26 concepts uh, of rethinking and reimagining Southeast Asia. And um, in, within this dictionary, T is for tigers and W is for were tigers. So it's uh, very closely related to two or three tigers. So now I'll speak a, a little bit more with the remaining time that I have about uh, this uh, project. I'll try to go through it as quickly as I can. So uh, again, this is a screenshot of the websites. And for those who are interested, this is the website uh, address, uh, cdosea.org.org, if you are interested. Um, so, you know, before speaking about the dictionary, I just wanted to show this map very quickly so that we know uh, as a, a, a refresher of what is Southeast Asia. So these are the countries that we usually associate with uh, Southeast Asia. And you know, the interesting thing, however, is the term Southeast Asia was never used by Southeast Asians until after the Second World War. I would say that the term Southeast Asia itself became popular only after the Second World War. So during the, the war, uh, the Allied forces created what is known as the Southeast Asian Command, which is a strategic body meant to liberate Southeast Asia from uh, Japanese occupation. Of course, all of these former uh, colonizers were one wanted to liberate Southeast Asia in order to recolonize it. Right? So uh, South 
In other words, you know, countries within Southeast Asia never had the conception that we were a region. You know, nothing in fact links Southeast Asia together uh, because Southeast Asia has never been united by a single religion, language or political system. So one of the key starting points of this project about Southeast Asia is then, you know, what constitutes the unity of this uh, region, right? So uh, as a kind of speculative uh, question. So that's why I kind of like propose these 26 terms uh, to offer some kind of uh, possible, possible uh, connection. And tigers uh, was one of the most important motifs. Uh, as I explained earlier, it, uh, tigers kind of like uh, disseminated across Southeast Asia uh, more than a million uh, years ago. And all across Southeast, Asia's, uh, Southeast Asia, we do find uh, myths of, uh, the, of these uh, quite structurally, quite similar myths about the uh, human and tiger transformations and metamorphosis. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So this was um, truly, truly engaging. Um, fantastic. Yes, I'll Thanks. stop here. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, I would like now to introduce um, Candice and then Candice Ling's um, the disciplinary artist whose work is multi-sensorial and often includes living and organic materials and processes such as mold, mushrooms, bacteria, and fermentation. Um, she is co-founder and co-director of the Artist Run Space Monte Vista projects and is an assistant professor at the UCL UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. Recent exhibitions include A Hard White Body, presented at Beton Salon in Paris, Portitus, Frankfurt, and the Logan Center for the Arts, University of Chicago, as well as shows at Gasworks and Human Resources, Los Angeles. Lin's work has been included in the Taipei Biennial, the Athens Biennial, Made in LA at the Hammer Museum, Sharjah Biennial in Beirut, and Sculpture Center in New York. She is the recipient of the Louis Comfort Tiffany Award for David of Art Residency and Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. Pista is an artist based in London and LA who works with installation, video, and performance to explore representations of the queer body. Staff has had solo exhibitions at Serpentine Galleries London, Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, Dundee Contemporary Arts, Numa in Zurich, the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA, Chisholm Hill Gallery London, and the Showroom Gallery also in London. Group exhibitions include, um, that including his work have been presented at the Walker Art Centre in Minneapolis and ICA London, among many others. Select performances and screenings include um, Naval Gallery in LA, Queer Lisboa, London Film Festival and Outfest at Red Cat, also in Los Angeles. They are the recipient of the Paul Hamlin Award for Visual Artists and have had residencies at the P13 Residency for the Arts, uh, Lux in London in the Showroom, Pogo Island Arts and BAM Center. Over to you, Candice and Pete. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I will say a little correction that I'm not actually involved with Monta Vista, but it's funny because uh, P and I met in 2010, 10? 2010 um, at a residency. And then later um, when I was involved with Monta Vista, I did invite P to do a show, but I haven't been involved there. So I don't want to take any false credit since uh, 2011 or something or 2012. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all and to hear about the resonances between our different projects. I wish we could see the show. Um, Roger is doing his usual thing of coming up right when we are beginning to talk. He's been <laughs> doing his best to distract P. <laughs> okay, can you see this? Okay, so, um, since we met in 2010, we at the time participated in each other's work. And then since about 2015, we've been working on a collaborative project that came out of us talking to each other about some work we were doing on biomedical hacking, plants, um, histories of colonialism in relationship to plants. And um, I think there's a lot of connections between how we're thinking about other species and the transformation of matter and bodies 
um, that I heard in Sue and um, Jill's work too that are nice connections. Um, so since 2015, we've been working on some collaborations that involve hacking commercial fog machines and using our own herbal tinctures that have primarily used anti-androgen plants. And um, we run those through the fog machines and create a kind of atmosphere that either has been large scale installations using um, just kind of like common household good parts like ducting and buckets and jars. Um, and this, you can kind of, sometimes the photos, it's a little bit hard to capture the moment of the fog, the hormonal fog being released, but you can kind of see in some of these iterations, um, different forms that it took. This one, I actually didn't go up for the install, but <laughs> he did. Um, and um, yeah, so for, for our contribution to Daphne, it's um, a, small version similar, similar to, to this, this one, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah 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 so yeah so maybe it's easy if i s switch back to this one so you can kind of see there's a a smoke machine that's been taken apart and sort of rewired and reconnected and so like candace was saying we take these herbs um that primarily have anti-androgenic qualities so that's to say they inhibit testosterone production in the body um, they're distilled through a kind of methodologies taken from herbalism and then really like pumped through the machine and turned into smoke. Um, you saw in some of the images that's included like large scale installations as well as single pipes hanging from the ceiling or just these discrete machines. We've also given a lot of readings and workshops. Um, uh, we hotboxed a van in the car park of a supermarket here in LA and invited people to come smoke inside with us. Um, and I think that one of the things that the work does um, is kind of propose, or I, I think more than propose, it sort of reinforces that hormones, although they're often understood as kind of stable determinants of binary sex, estrogen, progesterone being coded female, um, testosterone as male, in fact, this, this fluctuates constantly both in and outside of our bodies. Um, and through kind of plant matter as well as um, human corporeal matter, I suppose. Um, I think the work troubles the sort of common, common presumptions of what these molecules do in the body. Um, and we're doing it often in these very sort of normative, normative and regulatory spaces of the institution. Um, I think of the work as being born of a certain optimism. Uh, mm -hmm coming, however, from many violent histories, both the history of medicine in, in relation to trans bodies and trans people, uh, but also like Candace said, the sort of history of palm trade and colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna briefly talk about some of our solo work that brought us to the overlaps that um, are present in our collaborative hormonal fog work. Um, so this is work that I made I have to say, I'm really tripped out by the fact that like I see you there, but I'm like talking to you here. <laughs> this is the first time we've done like a collaborative talk in the on a Zoom in the same room. Um, but um, so this is work from 2015 from a show that I did in LA um, called You Are a Spacious Fluid Sac, um, where I was beginning to do my um, solo kind of research with that then quickly overlapped with our research into uh, hormonal properties of plants, but also the way that they were used um, in uh, fights for reproductive rights or um, in worker and slave uprisings in terms of the use of plants for poisons or for medicines. So this work, um, I made a series of 2D works that have these kind of quotes. This quote is talking about um, spiritualist mediums channeling kind of famous male politicians um, as a way to voice um, legitimate authoritative power while the image of the drawing on top is a female medium with a kind of phallic um, ectoplasm and it's paired with juniper which was a plant that was um, used so much in Europe for abortions that during the time that medicine was getting professionalized and wrested away from female midwives and healers um, they were forcibly ripping up these juniper um, court like these 
these courtyard areas that were known places that communities would go to gather this plant, um, which is really good for um, giving you an abortion. Um, so there are other works that were part of this series. Um, this one is called Minimizing Males. It has a drawing of Wolbachia, which is a bacteria that parasitizes insects and makes them all female and gives them the ability to reproduce on their own. And it's paired with um, licorice and hops, which are really high in estrogen, which are some of the plants that we used in our hormonal fog tincture. Um, we did also do, we did also make a little bit of uh, hormonal herbal um, testosterone with pine pollen. So this one shows pine pollen, um, which I read about being used uh, by the forest as a way to like have an orgy between species where the pine pollen is like dropping it onto the ground and then the fungi are eating it and taking it underneath the ground um, to all the bacteria and nutrients um, get disseminated and then the animals are also like eating it and pooping and like having a having a I mean it's just like they're all eating the semen of the plant and like um, getting energy from it so that was something I was interested in and then we took that research into our own um, our own installations together. Um, this is a book I made where I was thinking about these kind of multi-species connections in the scientist Lynn Margulis's work, um, where I was really trying to look at science as a way to rethink um, what would queer notions of kinship and um, like reproduction in other forms like parasitism or other things like that. Um, I feel like I'm talking for too long now. No, <laughs> okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, this was the year after in 2016. This is a later version of it that was at Banff where, where we met in 2010. This, this installation was reinstalled in 2019. This work system for a stain took um, the research I was doing into plants and thinking about plants in relationship to gender and species and in this case, I was thinking more in relationship to colonial trade goods. So I combined cochineal, which is the insect that is used to make red dye with um, a fermented tea and sugar that had opium poppies um, tinctured into it. And this was boiling and distilling into a steam that dripped into this basin and um, slowly created this stain that collected um, either in an, a separate space or in a space kind of far away from the system part of the installation. Okay. Amazing. Yeah, so likewise, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I make by myself, but there's often these sort of interesting Venn diagram overlaps between mine and Candace's work. And I, I think in some way it elucidates on, on, on our place in Manea's exhibition at ACA. Um, something I was going to give a little context to was that part of what I was interested in when we began working together was uh, that I had been looking a lot at the history of self-medding. Um, and so at that time, I'd particularly been looking into the archives uh, at The One here in Los Angeles and looking at early newsletters and documents that were being shared around people who were being diagnosed with HIV very early on um, in the epidemic who were sharing information with each other around how to essentially misuse medications to try and treat a disease at which or an infection at which point they did not know what what was happening um, some of these newsletters included information on how to essentially lie to a, a doctor um, to go in and describe your cough or your you know your symptoms as being one particular way so that you could be prescribed a drug that you could then use for what was actually going on what was interesting to me about that was that in my own life, um, I was looking a lot and talking to and being involved in communities of trans people um, who are also self-medding essentially. Um, and this is, a, this is a practice that is incredibly important to a lot of trans people. Um, it's something that is really community oriented and horizontal and is produced in a context where um, a system such as the medical industrial complex doesn't provide adequate care. Um, yeah, wait, I just, okay, so I'm gonna get to the work, <laughs> get to the work. Um, so anyway, in all of these places, I was looking at kind of hacking the body, hacking institutions, um, rerouting information and knowledge. 
So this image is from an exhibition um, at the Serpentine in 2019 uh, that kind of was trying to look at structural violence, um, registers of violence, as the institution was in some way itself turned inside out. Um, and so looking at the architectural foundations of the building, light, space, air, um, and then channeling through that these kind of feelings, I suppose, um, of an ambient threat and ambient violence that I described as being akin to being on Venus. Um, and so a, a planet, a space like our own that's actually imbued with violence um, is unlivable, is a kind of parallel state of being um, that in fact is probably very much living here within us at all times. Um, so there is many permutations of unseen violence that we all um, live with that channels through our body, that channels through our institutions, whether the medical one or the one of culture, of, of museums. Um, it contained a number of works. Yeah, this one was a video work um, that the first half of the video is all footage of the kind of um, capturing and processing of animal capital, um, skins, fur, urine, semen, um, as well as people sort of interacting in, in the sort of reproductive capacities of animals. So kids collecting tadpoles. Uh, people feeding animals in the park endlessly and things like that, um, rendered in this kind of psychedelic uh, fashion. Sucking your finger. Yeah, my cat licking my fingers. Um, these are a couple of stills. There's, there's sort of, I kept calling it like psychedelic goth. But do you want to say that the pipes were leaking? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Um, so the <laughs> Candace is reminding me. <laughs> Throughout the ceiling of the gallery, you can see these pipes that have been added, um, and those were dripping acid constantly into the gallery space. Um, I worked with a chemist and we developed a kind of blend, you could say, of acids that were both um, produced by the body, produced in nature, and also synthetically produced in labs. Uh, I don't have any images here, but there was also a series of etchings that were all made through intaglio etching, so washing steel with acid um, to burn images into, uh, into the steel. And in a way, I thought of this whole show as engaging with the kind of volatility of, of blood, hormones, acid, um, and, and bodies, human and animal both. Um, and then just finally, a, a video work that we often show as part of our installations. Um, it's called Bathing. It was made in 2018. Where I worked, I worked with a dancer called Kaya Nelstrand um, to develop a choreography um, that really leaned into drunkenness, fucked upness, um, as maybe a kind of queer state of being, as a, as a state of being that troubles and ruptures a sort of good, sober, upstanding, usually cis, white, able, way of being or becoming. Um, she, it's a little hard to tell, she falls constantly in and out of this shallow basin of water um, that each time sort of produces a new form of, of fucked upness, essentially. Um, and she, she writhes, she becomes animal, she sort of is ecstatic. Um, and, it, and it ends with her um, kind of pissing back into the basin before the video loops and she kind of continues mm -hmm. to dance. Um, so when P was saying that the, that bathing video is sometimes incorporated into our installation, we did this version at Shanghai, um, NYU, Shang, on NYU's Shanghai campus ICA, um, where we, you can see the like kind of mini screen there of bathing in the left side of the image. Um, and the, central what would you call that stainless steel yeah it's, it's a it's a welded steel basin essentially so we we did do some versions of our collaborative work showing um solo works that um you can see my work toxic semiotics in the back there um that have connections with each other so like connections around um porosity of bodies and bodily boundaries intoxication, toxicity. Yeah, and I think ones that sort of trouble, trouble the narration of history, trouble the kind of, um, I don't know, su suppositions of making of institutions, I suppose. And I think, 
I think we should leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you both so much. This was uh, really great. Thank, thank all of you, in fact, for the for the gener very generous introduction to the projects that you're showing in a biography of Daphne, but also connected um, works um, in your in your practices. To come back to the to the former category, the projects that you're showing in in uh, Etaka and the general framework of, of the exhibition, uh, which I attempted to introduce in the beginning, I'd like to return to this connection between Daphne's decelerated becoming tree, the slowed down metamorphosis, and the very strong connection to, to time and perhaps deceleration that exists in, um, in your respective works. I find that in the processes of um, Jill becoming a diamond and, and the photo portrait painting becoming a complete work, as opposed to the relative incompletion it is in uh, today, um, in the also in the processes of visitors traversing um, the hormonal fog and being subjected to this infinitesimal transformation or disruption of the hormonal balances in their body. And finally, in, in this vertiginous um, comparison in, in, in a kind of non-space, you know, in a kind of cosmic abyss that is perhaps one million years ago or one million years from now uh, in the encounter between George Coleman and, and the tiger in Sue's uh, remarkable video installation. There is a, there is a very conscious pairing um, of, um, of metamorphosis and a slowed down temporality. So it seems that all three projects in very different ways rests this notion of transformation from of the the abruptness that it may have um, it may have connoted in earlier in earlier narratives that span from that span from uh, Ovid to Kafka we we must assume that Gregor Samsa turns into a beetle overnight that it's and and that the transformation in Kafka's metamorphosis is very surprising to the to the protagonist himself. So transformation is is turned into into something very very different, a very different temporal metabolism, uh, something that has an ongoingness, uh, something that seems to be permanent. So there seems to be a, a permanence of metamorphosis rather than metamorphosis as a as an incident. I was wondering if if you could um, comment. I, I hope it's not an unfair question just because of its vastness, but I was wondering if you could comment on on that perspective. Um, of a of a slow metamorphosis, especially perhaps in terms of the urgencies and transformations that um, we're all captured in um, in the in the Anthropocene, heading towards this this cataclysm that seems to have already occurred, but on, and on the other hand, um, um, attempting to endure in space. Candice and P, since. Um, since I see you on my screen, would you mind responding to that? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a dense question to try to unpack. I mean, I, the, what I was thinking, and this is sort of comes like I don't know, I suppose heavily from a trans perspective, is that we're often told that um, the transformation of the body is the thing that will destroy the family, will destroy intimate relationships. Uh, will destroy, uh, you know, society's fabric itself, when in fact it seems what's so apparent is that a desire, a sort of violent desi desire for fixity is what in fact is leading to this destruction that you're talking about, Linnea, mm -hmm. that we're unwilling to, we're unwilling to change, we're unwilling to see differently. Um, and in fact, that the people who are seen to be the ones that cross the most, that transgress the most, whether that's across borders uh, or between sexed or gendered ways of being, and I'm sure in many others racially too, are kind of um, held as, 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 as the sort of agents of destruction, agents of chaos. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, and castigated as, as a result. I, I know that's sort of a, a sideways take on your question maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, very, very useful, nonetheless. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could return for a second to to, to this question of, of 
time of animation and reanimation, the 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 the, the incident um, that is narrated in Leutemann's um, engraving that you base your the, the moment when the tiger attacks the abstraction that is imbi the embodied abstraction of the theodolite that is going to displace it the tiger from its biotope and the way you stretch that moment you stretch that event into not unlike the way in which time is stretched in Bernini's Apollo and Daphne at the Borghese gallery perhaps although the, the comparison might be without much merit um, but there's this element of, of time attenuated and amplified made made cosmical but also in, embodied in this very specific characters that inhabit very specific territories and the telescoping between these two realms is um, one of the fascinating things I think in your in your work yeah thank you for the for the question and the and the comments I think uh, it's very interesting to think about transformation and metamorphosis uh, through the lens of uh, speed you know and uh, and time and duration so so very often you know I, I think about the fast and the slow as simply a matter of scale it's uh, you know how you know what is the the, the framework or the lens uh, for measurement uh, so I, I would say the very fast and the very slow you know these are just uh, uh, different types of scales that we are uh, using to to evaluate right the rate but uh, something which struck me uh, was that in a phrase uh, from Jill's uh, presentation earlier when she described herself uh, this becoming this uh, diamond ring and how in the present it's a it's a kind of a pregnant pause so I want to borrow that phrase the pregnant pause uh, because that actually also defines exactly this moment of confrontation between the tiger and uh, George Dromgo Coleman, uh, which you have also uh, uh, described, right? So I mentioned earlier that the actors, uh, the, the actor and vocalist uh, whom my motion captured was suspended uh, from the ceiling while we were doing the motion capture. So this was an attempt to recreate that moment in the prints when the tiger and George Dromgo Coleman were in that pregnant pause you know, that moment of suspension of time when they were both uh, up in the air, li literally, you know, waiting to see how things fall. And uh, this pregnant pause, you know, is something extremely uh, interesting because it's, uh, I would say, it's pregnant with potential, is pregnant with the potential for change, for deviation, for the swerve, if you want. Okay? So, uh, you know, there are these uh, different types of uh, uh, relationships of time, potential, or sort of like compressed into that moment, the, the pregnant pause. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. Um, Jill, the, the same amorphous uh, question, re reiterated, but also a question from, from the audience, um, which is when eventually your body becomes a diamond and placed in the ring setting, is there any requirement for the piece within quotation marks to be displayed for the public to view? Yeah, there's a crazy thunderstorm happening, <laughs> and lightning <laughs> storm, so I can hardly hear you guys. Um, um, but yeah, uh, I love that you attached on to pregnant pause because it's that that idea I think about a lot and I I think it is um, I haven't I mean I do think about it in relationship to time but I appreciate the question because it kind of forces the lens that way but what's interesting about like becoming diamond is that it's a natural process that usually happens in the earth because of this is great. I have to turn you guys up full volume. I, I can't hear a thing. It's so um, that the, the way diamonds naturally happen is a compression with the earth over a very long period of time. And here, and it makes me think of Candace and P. Staff's work of like, there's these natural things happening, but then you can kind of go in and sort of hack it, right? And that's the making of the diamonds is this kind of acceleration of a natural process of becoming. Um, and maybe the, the question from the audience is a way to um, 
go into the thing of time. Um, I, I made auto portrait pending um, because of a kind of personal story that um, the, the story was that my grandmother during the depression was at a party and found a diamond ring on the floor of the party or outside on the sidewalk. The story depends who's telling it. And, um, and she took it home and put it in her sewing basket and then uh, later on put it in a safe and everyone thought it was a lie. And when she died, my mom went to Chicago and opened the safe and there was this giant diamond ring in there. And um, she lived through the depression and had very little money and had this like enormous diamond um, in the safe and it was in the dark. Um, so it never really got to be a diamond. Um, and hiding. And so in my own piece um, with auto portrait pending, you see that there's the light on um, the ring. And once, once the diamond is set, there's a rule that it always has to be lit. Um, and I would love for it to be in a museum where it was always shown um, because it is a kind of like personal legacy. I mean, I don't usually tell the story because I don't want it to become like a personal, um, you know, to minimize it into that. But it did, it was behind a lot of my thoughts of um, how to present it and um, what a serious thing it is to transform oneself into a diamond to transform a body into a diamond um, um, and, and how it's displayed and lives on um, in this transformed process. That's a very interesting connection to the to the museum, which actually um, we, uh, that I'm I'm very glad you're you're making because it gives me an occasion to introduce uh, an aspect of the installation. Um, there's a work that that mediates between um, can so two is quite nearby, but just between auto portrait pending and, and hormonal folk, there is a work that. Uh, um, that was uh, that was contributed by Inge Meyer, a, a Dutch artist who has been studying the archives of the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam and, and discovered that um, during the directorship of Willem Sandberg, who is, who is the person who basically shaped the institution into what the Stedelijk is today, there was a, a practice of, of exhibiting plants side by side artworks. Uh, the Monstera Deliciosa, which is behind Bianca, um, is, is actually the plant that was juxtaposed by Sandberg in this first revolutionary gesture with a Piet Mondrian boogie woogie painting. And from then onwards, uh, Sandberg produced, sort of accumulated a, a remarkable art collection at, at the Stedelijk, but also a, a plant collection um, consisting of a few hundred specimens that were juxtaposed in ways that are increasingly delirious as, as one spends, and hypnotic, as one spends time with Inge's installation, which is this trompe continuous wallpaper environment of kind of um, uh, impossibility to focus on the artwork as one's attention is continuously mobilized by the foreign body of the plant. The foreign body is in um, contemporary museology, probably prohibiting the presence of plants which tend to create their own weather and which tend to bring all sorts of moisture and contaminants into the otherwise pristine environments where, where heritage is being, um, is being um, guarded and, and preserved. Um, I don't, I don't feel that this is a, a conclusion to, to the conversation that, uh, that we've had and that I wish to, to thank you for. It's just a, an attempt to, to kind of frame this as, as the co-presence of, of, of art and life uh, turning into one another over and over again. Um, yeah, Bianca, Bianca mentioned that we, we need to, to wrap up. Um, thanks all of you. Thank, thank, thank you very much to our audience for, for um, for um, taking part in this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jill, to Candice and P for, for your wonderful responses and your, for your generous participation to the, to the project. Um, hope to speak to all of you very soon.
Thank you, Mehna. Thanks, Thanks Mehna. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, SNP, for your excellent you. presentations and discussion today. Um, we would also like to thank Tyson and Imran for interpreting um, our event this morning and to you all for joining us today. Um, our next public program is another online artist talks for a biography of Daphne on Wednesday, 28 July at 8 p.m. Um, which will have Inga's, um, will feature Inga Meyer. Um, and it, it's going to be great to have to see the wallpaper and just to see some of that process that Mehna just mentioned. Um, and we also have a catch up with the curator exhibition tour at ECHA with Mehna on Saturday, 31st of July at 3 p.m. Um, registration links are available on ECHA's website at ECHA.melbert. Thanks, guys, and see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.